Pixar, like Disney, is one of the most iconic animation studios ever, and although more recently they sometimes skip having a villain, the Pixar library has a lot of unique bad guys. We've already covered the earliest Pixar films, but today we're going further to see how the next batch of Pixar villains deserve to atone for their crimes. Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and this is Sentencing Pixar Villains to Their Crimes, Part 2. Today, the movies we'll be talking about are Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, Cars, and Ratatouille. First, we'll start with the fan favorite, Finding Nemo. While only appearing very briefly, the first criminal on our docket is the Barracuda. This large predatory fish appears very early, where it attacks marlin and coral, as well as seemingly eating or stealing 399 of their 400 clownfish eggs. He murders coral and assaults marlin, both of which are hefty crimes, and while we can assume this may be normal behavior for barracudas, we know from the sharks that predators can shift to be vegetarians of some sort. Since we assume the barracuda is as sentient as as the other animals, we assume the Barracuda would get punished for this. We sentence the Barracuda to death, likely through the electric chair since most of the film takes place in and around Australia. We know that's a lot for our first criminal, but thinking about everything we see in the film, it would make a lot of sense for this punishment. Next is the Anglerfish. The Anglerfish pops up about halfway through the movie when Marlin and Dory go deep into the ocean to gather the mass they had dropped. Like the Barracuda, it doesn't appear for very long. Unlike the Barracuda, it only has one crime to report, and that's the attempted murder of Marlin and Dory. Much like the Barracuda, we're assuming this anglerfish is sentient, like every other animal, hence why we believe it needs to be punished. We're giving the anglerfish 25 years in prison. Sure, one could plead that it's a predator's instinct, but like before, we've seen predators stop eating random fish, so sadly, it wouldn't work. Next, the sharks are on trial. Bruce, Anchor, and Chum are three sharks who Marlin and Dory meet early on in their journey. Initially, they seem scary and intimidating, essentially kidnapping Marlin and Dory for their intervention meeting. Fish are friends, not food. Chum, the smallest and sort of craziest shark, is also responsible for the murder of his fish buddy, showing he isn't fully clean yet. When Dory starts bleeding, Bruce gets a sniff of her blood and attempts to eat her and Marlin. This, however, would likely be dismissed because it's shown to be because of instinct and nothing else. The most appropriate punishment for the three of them would likely be 25 years in prison with a chance of parole, mostly for the murder, and that would be only on Chum. As for Bruce and Anchor, they'd likely get community service. Bruce and Anchor are farther along in turning themselves away from eating fish, and the court would likely see that. Chum, however, seems pretty quick to fall off the wagon, and as such, likely won't be able to convince the court he's alright. However, if Marlin and Dorley were to testify, or he could convince the court, it's likely that Chum would get a lighter sentence. Our next criminal is Dr. P. Sherman. Sherman is a dentist, and one could argue the main villain, since he kidnapped Nemo. Now, in Sherman's eyes, he saw Nemo as unable to survive in the wild and thought he was doing a good thing. He's gonna be here Friday to pick you up. However, he's also responsible for kidnapping Gil. At least, it's implied that way, since Gil is said to also be from the ocean. In his defense, he isn't aware of how sentient the fishes are, although he does get a hint at the end of the film. One could also argue he's an accessory to the supposed continuous murder that Darla commits because he supplies her with all the fish. We've decided that six months in jail with a chance at parole and six additional months of community service would be adequate. If he was fully aware at how sentient the fish were, then his punishment would be much more severe. But as it stands, he can only get this much at the moment. The final criminal is sad, but it's Darla. Darla is the niece of Dr. P. Sherman, and while she doesn't live in Australia, from what we can see, she visits her uncle quite often. Darla has two crimes, mostly because, like Dr. Sherman, she isn't aware of how sentient the fish are. She commits at least one case of manslaughter when she kills the fish we see in the photo, and then assaults Nemo in the bag when she thinks he's dead. Darla may have killed other fish based on her reputation, but we can't blame her too much since she's a child. Wake up! Wake up! At worst, she may get a slap on the wrist, or a few months of community service, but nothing more than that. Darla's reputation precedes her, and if it wasn't for the fact that she was unaware of what kind of damage she was doing, she'd probably get a harsher sentence. Now let's go to the 1960s with The Incredibles. Our first criminal is Bomb Voyage. 
Bomb Voyage is a mind-based criminal who appears during the prologue. It's heavily implied that he's been committing crimes for a while, and while it's unknown what he's done, we can confirm that he's committed bank robbery, arson, vandalism, and attempted murder. While the first three are obviously part of his shtick, the attempted murder is against a child, specifically Buddy, when he sticks a bomb on him. This in itself is a serious crime, even considering what Buddy becomes at the end. Bomb Voyage is a repeat criminal with at least one attempted murder under his belt, and this means the punishment should be life in prison without a chance of parole. We can't in good conscience give him more because his worst crime was an attempt and not a full-on murder, so he gets off easy for now. Next is the Underminer. He pops up only briefly, having a much more expanded role in the sequel. Despite his brief appearance, he has a few crimes to talk about, those being disturbing the peace, vandalism, and destruction of property. It's also implied that he may have caused some physical damage to civilians, and maybe even killed some. However, we have no evidence. These damages are likely in the thousands, if not more. Despite all the destruction, his punishment would actually be quite small. A few years in prison with a chance of parole is the highest we'd go. This is mostly because we aren't accounting for The Incredibles 2, so as it stands, he'd probably be out of prison in no time. Gilbert Huff is our next criminal. Huff is the head of InsuraCare, the company that Bob works at. I give you a phone call! While he doesn't fit the typical aesthetic of a criminal, he does commit a few criminal actions that are worth noting. First, he tries to get Bob to commit insurance fraud, and it seems that this is a repeated crime because it's implied that Gilbert has been doing it for a while and forces all his employees to do this. This means that even when someone is supposed to gain benefits, Gilbert denies them, which is fraudulent on its best day. He also criminally threatens Bob, threatening to fire him if he doesn't do what he says, which could also be considered criminal coercion to some degree. Gilbert's crimes are non-violent, which means his punishment would not be nearly as severe as others, being a few years in prison and a week or so of community service. Gilbert likely has many more crimes we're unaware of, and it's implied that he doesn't really care about the law, which means it's unlikely that this is all he's done. But with what we have, we can't punish him further. Next on the docket is Mirage. Mirage works with Syndrome and is the one who hires Bob to deal with the Omnidroid. She starts strong by stalking both Frozone and Bob under the orders of Syndrome. She causes destruction of property when the tablet explodes and causes the sprinklers to go off. She courses Bob into facing off against the Omnidroid, is an accessory to the two different counts of attempted murder when Syndrome uses the Omnidroid against Bob twice. She also helps commit the attempted murder of Helen, Dash, and Violet, being the one responsible for firing off the rockets at their plane. Mirage gets the benefit of the doubt because most of the crimes are done under Syndrome's orders. Time you gamble, bet your own life. By the end of the movie, she switched sides, helping the Incredibles with their escape back to the city. Mirage has a lot of crimes that are hard to deny, but what she does have is a good character. And even if the charges aren't dropped, it's likely her punishment won't be too severe. We envision 15 years in prison with a chance of parole. But if the charges against her were dropped, she'd get next to nothing because all of her crimes were against the pars. Mirage isn't that hardened of a criminal, and unless she's done something we don't know about, she'd likely get out on good behavior. And the final incredible villain is Syndrome. This Earl Hickey voice character is a supervillain who originally went by the name of Buddy and Incrediboy because he wanted to work with Mr. Incredible. My name is Incrediboy. After Mr. Incredible told him he wasn't allowed, he starts off strong by breaking into Mr. Incredible's car without permission or acknowledgement from Bob. After being kicked out of the car, he decides to commit his life to villainy and building the Omnidroids. This has caused up to 19 cases of murder since we see 18 heroes in the montage and also are introduced to Gazer Beam's corpse prior to that. He then attempts to murder Mr. Incredible twice with the Omnidroid and then attempts to murder Helen, Dash, and Violet with the rocket when they try to land on Nomanasan Island. Upon releasing the Omnidroid, he'd also get in trouble for vandalism, general destruction, and disturbing the peace. At the end of the film, he also tries to kidnap Jack-Jack, which really doesn't go very well for him. Syndrome's crimes show that he's really deranged and very obviously searching for revenge he likely won't get. So his punishment is execution, likely through the electric chair, although one could argue that maybe a firing squad would be more fitting. Syndrome has plenty of issues and is named after that for a reason, falling into having a hero syndrome, and we feel his punishment should reflect how dangerous he is. Now it's time for one of the most mean Pixar films, Cars. 
First is the delinquent road hazards. They're like a gang, formed of four cars that are menaces on the road. They don't appear for very long, but they do commit a pretty obvious act of reckless endangerment by making Mac the semi-truck fall asleep on the trip to California. Pretty music. This causes the disappearance of Lightning McQueen, which becomes a media circus unlike any other. Since the film takes place in a fictional Arizona town, we'll be using Arizona laws, and in Arizona, a charge like this only gives two years in prison and five years probation. So that's all we'll give them. If it wasn't for the fact that they only appear briefly, we'd be willing to assign them more crimes, but as it stands, this is all they do. The second and final criminal of this movie is Chick Hicks. Chick is one of the three best race cars at the different events we see throughout the movie, and is one of the three that goes to the tiebreaker for the Piston Cup. Chick is a terrible person and is the most hardened criminal. Chick's main crime beyond cheating at most of his events is assault. There are four different assaults, two on unnamed cars and two on lightning. That last one causes lightning to pop a tire and need to get it replaced. Doc, I'm flat! I'm flat! Keen viewers and those with good memories may think we've forgotten one, but no, that final assault, the one he does on the king that causes a crash, we're classifying as attempted murder. This is because he does this with full knowledge of what may happen, and we see how much damage it does to the king. It's even implied that he's done this before, and this is by far the worst crime in the film. Assuming there's no laws protecting these actions while in the races, he'd feel the full force of the law. The punishment should fit the crime, and this crime is morally reprehensible, so we'd give him life in prison with a chance of parole. Honestly, we wish he'd done more because we don't like him, and we wish we could sentence him to execution. All right, and the final film has a surprising amount of villains, and that is Ratatouille. You know, the French rat cooking movie. First is Mabel, who is the old lady early in the film. It's unknown what her life was like before, but what we see are a few violent crimes she might be able to avoid sentencing for. She carries gallons of rat poison that she intends to use on the colony of rats that we know are sentient, but it's unknown if she does. She then attempts to kill Remy and Emile, but once again, she doesn't seem aware of their human-like intelligence or sentience, so this would likely be thrown out. However, her final attempted murder of Remy and the rest of the colony happens after she witnesses Remy go back for the book and the rats making the boat, which would imply that she should know they're smarter than they seem. Despite this, these would likely be thrown out because there was no way to know that the rats were sentient, so she'd likely just get community service or have to pay La Ratatouille for the damages. Of course, there's always a chance she was fully aware, and she could get a much harsher sentence, but we have to go off what we know. Next is sous chef Horst. It has been confirmed that Horst has spent some time in prison, and we're not sure for what, so we're going to assume that each of his stories are true, at least in some sense, especially since his only real criminal action was criminally threatening Skinner when he came onto the property after being forced to leave. He mentions that he's defrauded a major company, committed armed robbery with a ballpoint pen, and killed someone with this thumb. I killed a man with this thumb. Killing someone is broad, and he doesn't use the term murder, so it could be classified as self-defense or manslaughter. Well, he's not currently in prison, so manslaughter makes the most sense. The armed robbery is interesting because the item he used, the ballpoint pen, is a unique way of doing things. Assuming France applies double jeopardy standards, he probably won't get in trouble for those things, and just a threat would run him a few months in jail at worst. Without double jeopardy, he'd likely land 25 years or so. Seeing as most countries utilize double jeopardy, we will as well. Next is Anton Ego. Anton Ego is the world-renowned food critic and a lover of food by his own admission. Ego doesn't really do much in terms of criminal acts. Even publishing a second review of Gusteau's prior to the information of the rats being public wouldn't be considered criminal. However, he has one crime under his belt that is worth mentioning, and that is technically the manslaughter of Gusteau. When Ego goes to the restaurant, he publishes a scathing review that ends up causing the restaurant to lose a star. This heartbreak causes Gusteau to die, and while this is a bit fantastical, one could argue that there is a link between these two events. Ego's sentence would be rather light, as there was no intent to murder. Maybe two to three years in prison with a chance of parole would be sufficient, even if that's a very low ball for a crime of that stature. Sure, Ego didn't pull a trigger, but his actions did lead to the death of Gusto. If this isn't thrown out, this is an applicable punishment. And the final criminal is Chef Skinner. Skinner is the head chef of Gusto's restaurant and was previously Gusto's sous chef. 
He takes over the restaurant, and then comes Linguini. He tries his damnedest to stop Gusteau's will from going through, which is a crime in itself. Very well. If it's linguine they want. He doesn't really commit any crimes during the beginning of the film, where he's a chef, mostly doing stuff after he was fired as head chef. He attempted to murder Remy, but he was unaware of his sentience. After learning it, he commits grand theft auto, impedes traffic, commits destruction of property, and trespasses on both a boat and the kitchen of the restaurant. All of this because he was chasing Remy after being at least slightly aware of his sentience. He then not only kidnaps Remy using a mousetrap, he then threatens Remy, followed by extorting him. Skinner's sentence would be life in prison with the chance of parole, although based on his personality, it's unlikely he would get that parole. Skinner may not have murdered anyone, but it's worth noting that after learning of his sentience, he continually does criminal actions. All right, court is adjourned. Let us know in the comments section if you agree with our choices and tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos. But most importantly, stay wicked.